Well, good morning, Tamworth Elim Church, and a very happy Mother's Day to you. Hopefully, all you mums out there are being treated well by your little ones and maybe your not-so-little ones as well. Perhaps you've had breakfast in bed or maybe a card or some chocolates or flowers or, or hopefully something. Um, as I was looking through the Bible trying to find a verse that I could read this morning to encourage all the mums amongst us, I came across um, some advice given to a king in Proverbs by his mother. And uh, the advice is about the kind of woman that he should be looking for. She describes her this way. Bold power and glorious majesty are wrapped around her as she laughs with joy over the latter days. Her teachings are filled with wisdom and kindness as loving instruction pours from her lips. She watches over the ways of her household and meets every need that they have. Her sons and daughters arise in one accord to extol her virtues and her husband arises to speak in glowing terms. There are many valiant and noble ones, but you have ascended above them all. Charm can be misleading and beauty is vain and so quickly fades, but the virtuous woman lives in wonder, awe and fear of the Lord. She will be praised throughout eternity. So go ahead and give her the credit that is due, for she has become a radiant woman, and all her living works of righteousness deserve to be admired from the gateway of every city. Clearly, this was a mother wanting the absolute best for her son. And believe me, that's only part of the list. And maybe today, as I've read those words, you thought, yeah, you know what? That's me. I am that person. Or maybe not. Maybe instead of being wrapped in bold power and glorious majesty, it's an old t-shirt and some ripped jeans. Instead of your teachings being filled with wisdom and kindness, maybe you've just asked Alexa to explain your kid's homework to them instead. Instead of meeting every need of your household, maybe you're just about holding the house together. And instead of your children and your partner extolling your virtues, maybe you just get an occasional thank you and maybe a cup of tea. But whether you are a perfect mother or not, let me just say today, thank you. Thank you for all that you do, big and small, seen and unseen. You are a blessing to your family. And you deserve to be admired from every gateway to the city. Although, I doubt you've got time for that. The observant among you will have noticed that I am in the church building today. Um, And that is because we are getting this space ready for you to be able to come and join us again in person really soon. We want to be able to meet in the same space to pray and to worship and to hear from God's word together. But I also want to reassure you that if you are not able to make it here in person, we are going to continue to do all that we have been doing online. So whether you can be here physically or not, you will always be able to join in and make a connection with us here at the church. We're going to start off our service now with some worship. And uh, a little bit later, Brenda and Amy are going to take over for the family section. But before we do that, let's just take a moment to quiet our hearts, to begin to pray, to think about all that God wants to say and speak into our lives today. Let's just close our eyes for a minute. God, our Heavenly Father, as we gather together as your family, God, as your church, we want to take a moment today to say a big thank you to all of those who are mothers amongst us, maybe to their own family, maybe just to the church itself. God, thank you for all that they do, all of the the fixing and the mending and the cleaning and the cooking and the playing and the fun and the laughter and the games and the time that they take to, to encourage us and be with us and lift us up. God, we want to just say thank you. Would you bless them today? Would you let them know how loved they are. And Heavenly Father, we pray as well for those who today are perhaps remembering mothers who are no longer with us. God, bring to mind all of the good times that were shared together. Father, help us to feel your comfort and your love and your strength today also. 
And God, as we join in with this service now, as we begin to worship your name, Father, would you just come and, and speak to our hearts. God, let us hear what we need to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I hope you enjoyed the service. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you.
everyone, it's great to have you with us today. As we come together this morning, we just wanted to take a moment to give a shout out to all the mums, grandmas, aunties and all round wonderful women in our lives who support us, care for us and look after us. We just want to wish you a happy Mother's Day from all of our children and young people at Limitless Tamworth. To all the kids and youth, we really hope you've had a great week. How have you found your first week back at school? Please let us know in the comments. We would love to hear from you. We're really looking forward to spending some time with you all today. And first up, we've got a few challenges, one of which will help us uncover this week's theme. Hello, everybody. Hey. Hello. Hello. Good, good. Have you all got your pen and paper ready? Good. So today we're going to be doing a sound effect quiz. So I'm going to play some sounds through my laptop. Hopefully you can hear them and you need to write down what you think it is. Here is the first one. Hope it works. Right, next one. I'm so confused. <laughs> Right, so the third one. And number four. <laughs> I'll play it again because it sounds really pretty. Number five. And the last one, number six. Actually sounds really scary for what it is. <laughs> right, that were your six. I'll play it once more and then we'll go around and just see what your answers were. So this was the first one, just to remind you. What did you guys put for the first one? I put a stapler. I put a stapler. It's not a stapler. Mouse. It's a computer mouse. <laughs> oh. Computer hmm. mouse. Clickety click click. Stapler was a good guess though. I can see why. That was a good guess. <laughs> right, the second one. Stapler again. <laughs> they want all the staplers. <laughs> Everyone put stapler. No, it's not a stapler. Door. <laughs> I've got pouring door? water, but it's not. You were close with door. Uh, I've put tapping. It was the opening and closing of a window. Next My one. windows don't sound like that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope mine are all right then. <laughs> they just fall out. <laughs> Your window sounds just like a stapler. <laughs> <laughs> so the third one I'm guessing you all got, which was this one. Was it water in a pan? It was flushing the toilet. <laughs> oh. The next one. <laughs> I think we all know what that one is. The recorder. The recorder? Oh, I had a piano. <laughs> <laughs> a recorder? <laughs> Your face is... <laughs> I thought it was really easy, and now I've just insulted Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> I'll accept piano, keyboard, or perhaps the chord if you want to go extra. <laughs> oh, funny. Hairspray. Hairspray? Oh, but not a stapler. Not a stapler, I'm afraid. Not a stapler. <laughs> and your last one, which actually sounds terrifying, but it's not terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rolling a coin. It's a coin. I'm spinning a coin. Oh. <laughs> of course. It's not, but it wasn't. I thought the spinning. second half sounded like those marbles in the Kaplunk game. I thought of a marble to start marble. with. Do you want to add up your scores then and let me know how you did and I'll go around each of you and we'll see how well you did. So, Brenda, I'll start with you. What did you get? One and a half. Nathan? Four. Ooh. Wow. 
get you. You didn't cheat and follow me round, did you, while I was recording them? <laughs> well, I know you did that one. I was in the room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I might take so a point off for that then. So I think three, we then. need to be technical. I'm only going to give you three because we live in That's the same world. Katie? Two. Karina? Three and a half. Three and a half. Oh. <laughs> think she's got you, Nay. Think she's got you. <laughs> Julie? Two and a half, and I'm booking myself a hearing test. <laughs> 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 Maybe it was my recording. Let's not be harsh on each other. Mine. And Tanya? Three. Three. So we have Karina is our victor with three Whoa. and a half points. Whoa. <laughs> well done. Let us know thank how you, you guys you. did at home. Did you do better or worse than the leaders? Are your ears better tuned to sound effect games than ours? So for the next thing, we're going to try and uncover our word for this week's theme. So I'm going to play you a short video clip. And in this video clip, there are six hidden letters. So you need to try and jot down the six letters and then unscramble them to work out what this week's theme is. You've got it already. Yes, I, I think so. Word games. <laughs> <laughs> is it gentle? It is gentle. Well done. That was so speedy. <laughs> I had no vowels. I just had everything else other than the E. <laughs> I was really cleaning that car well. I couldn't have made a point of any more. So let us know oh, if you managed to find the word gentle and hope you've enjoyed this challenge section. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 We hope that you enjoyed this morning's challenges. They helped us uncover this week's theme, which is gentle. The definition of gentle is showing a mild, kind or tender character. And we can see several examples of times in which Jesus helps reveal to us an image of a gentle God. And this morning we're going to hear one example from one of our church families as they share today's story. Jesus' disciples were busy arguing. They were arguing about which one of them was the most important. They thought that if they were the cleverest or the nicest or something like that, then Jesus would like them best. While they were busy arguing, some young children came over to see Jesus. When Jesus' disciples saw this, they tried to send the children away, saying, Jesus doesn't have time for you, and Jesus is too tired, go away. They were hard and unkind in how they treated the children wanting to see Jesus. Jesus saw this and immediately told the disciples to let the children come and see him. He didn't like how the disciples had spoken to the children. Jesus was gentle in how he spoke to the children. He invited them over and sat and talked with them and listened to what they had to say. Jesus told everyone that children are a really important part of God's kingdom. Thank you so much, Becky, Aid, Brandon and Maddie for that great story tell and amazing acting skills. In today's story, we saw that Jesus made a point of being gentle and approachable with the children. He spent time with them, even though the disciples didn't want the children bothering Jesus. Jesus made the point that he always has time for people, and this is the same for us. He wants us to turn to him and be close to him. And we can be certain that when we come to Jesus with anything, he will be gentle with us. There are some verses which can be found in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30, which we would like to read to you now. And while we read these verses, we'd like to encourage you to spend some time reflecting on today's theme of gentleness. While you're listening to the words, we want you to imagine that they have been written just for you and think about how this makes you feel. Come to me, all of you who are tired and have heavy loads. I will give you rest. Accept my work and learn from me. I am gentle and humble in spirit and will find rest for your souls. The work that I ask you to accept is easy and the load I give you to carry is not heavy. What an amazing reminder of Jesus's gentleness. As with every week, our challenge is to be more like Jesus. 
we're challenged to follow his example and be more gentle to those around us. Sometimes, if we're tired or grumpy, we can be hard or rough in how we respond to people, but the challenge to us is to be gentle in our responses to others, be considerate of their feelings and their situation, and to follow the example of Jesus. Before we finish our time together, let's pray. God, I thank you for the example that you set to us. I thank you that you are gentle with us and no matter how we are feeling or what we are going through, we can come to you confidently knowing that you will be gentle with us, take time for us, listen to us and show us how much you love us. And God, I pray that this week, whoever we encounter and whatever we do, that we will remember to show that same gentleness to the people around us. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today and we hope that you have a lovely week and we'll see you again very soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Even when the disciples didn't want the Jesus to be the... What you just said, didn't want Jesus to be a beaver. I think I did say Jesus to be a beaver.
morning. Over the last five weeks, we have been exploring what God is like, his character and his qualities, as found in the person of Jesus, who, according to our New Testament, is the exact representation of his being. We have learned that God is forgiving, loving, patient, compassionate, humble. And this morning, we're looking at another quality often associated with the word humble, which is gentle. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. The first line of that famous children's hymn by Charles Wesley that I used to sing when I was in primary school. And it gives us that warm and cosy image of Jesus with a child on his lap and a lamb at his feet as depicted in the children's storybooks. If you are someone who has read the New Testament, then you might find that the quality uh, gentleness is rather surprising, especially when we read of the time when Jesus made a whip and drove money changers out of the temple courts with sheep and cattle being scattered and tables and coins being overturned. Absolute mayhem. Then there were other occasions too when Jesus appeared to be anything but gentle, such as the time that he described the religious leaders being like whitewashed tombs and a brood of vipers. If you think that being gentle means being weak, insipid, wishy-washy, colourless, bland, tame, then I think you've got the wrong guy. Being gentle, in reference to Jesus, doesn't mean being genteel. Our problem is that we can never sum Jesus up in one word. <clears throat> he was far more than what can be included in a word, or even in a story. John concludes the Gospel um, of John uh, in 21 chapters, after telling many wonderful things about what Jesus did and said, he finishes with these words. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them was written down, I suppose even the whole world would not have enough room for the books that would be written. Obviously, John was, he was using hyperbole, an exaggeration for effect. But he makes his point well. We cannot contain Jesus in just a story and even less in a word. So whilst gentle doesn't tell us all that we need to know about Jesus, it's a word that does tell us something, something important. In fact, it was a word that Jesus used to describe himself in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, if you take a text out of a context, all you're left with is a con. So our first question is, what is Jesus referring to? Why did he refer to himself as gentle and humble in heart? Why not merciful and just, or patient and kind, or compassionate and caring in this context? And who, by the way, are the, the weary and the burden that Jesus refers to? And what is Jesus referring to when he invites people to take his yoke upon them? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, says Jesus. Well, let's start by the, the concept of a yoke. Literally, a yoke is a wooden beam that rested on the shoulders of oxen hitched to a plough and it is used to evenly distribute the burden of work between the two animals. But Jesus was using this language of a yoke in a more metaphorical way. Let me explain. In Jesus' day, as in our day, people had difficulty understanding and applying the scriptures. And this difficulty is perhaps best highlighted in the ways that people in Jesus' day interpreted laws about the, the Sabbath. In the Torah, which is the Jewish name for the first five books of the Bible, also referred to as the law, there was a command which stated, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Well, immediately following that verse, we are told that the people were not to work on the Sabbath day because God rested on the Sabbath after creating the world. But there's a problem. And the problem is this. Who defines work and who defines rest? What if work to one person is rest to the other? And if rest is to one person, what work is to another? And what does it mean to make a day holy? Someone needed to decide it. But who decides? Well, 
The Jewish rabbis understood that their role in the community was to study and meditate and discuss and pray and make those decisions on how the Torah, the Jewish law, would be lived out. Take this example of the Sabbath command that prohibited work. Rabbis would put people's actions into two categories, things that the rabbi permitted on the Sabbath and things which the rabbi forbade on the Sabbath. And different rabbis had different rules. And a rabbi's interpretation on how to live the Torah was spoken of as the rabbi's yoke. You followed a certain rabbi because you believed that rabbi's set of interpretations were closest to what God intended through the scriptures. And when you followed that rabbi, you were said to be taking up the rabbi's yoke. In addition to the 613 commands of the Jewish law, the rabbis then added their own interpretations on each of these laws and how they were to be lived in almost every conceivable situation. It became unbearable and some rabbis' yokes were much more unbearable than others. In effect, the religious leaders made people slaves to the Jewish law. Jesus said of these rabbis, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Again, keeping a text in its context, we notice that immediately following Jesus' words about his yoke being easy and his burden being light, Matthew tells us of two instances when Jesus got into trouble. Firstly, because his disciples picked up uh, some corn and began eating it on the Sabbath. And as incredible as it sounds to us, some rabbis believed that this constituted work and the disciples were harvesting grain on the Sabbath and therefore breaking the Sabbath law. Shortly afterwards on the Sabbath day, Jesus healed a man with a withered hand. But instead of praising God for these amazing miracles, the, the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus, believing that he had broken the Sabbath law. Can you imagine living in that way? It became unbearable. In contrast, Jesus invites all who were weary and burdened by the numerous petty rules imposed upon them to instead come to him, and he would give them rest for their souls. For his yoke, in other words, his ways, his teachings, his principles for living, his values for life are easy and his burden is light. Jesus is telling us that being a follower of his is not a matter of trying to keep a tedious set of rules and regulations nigh on impossible to keep, nor is it some wearisome drudgery. Jesus is promising that if we come to him and walk in his ways, then we will know freedom and joy and rest for our soul. The Jews had a lovely word for this, for this rest, shalom, the peace of God, that deep-seated sense of well-being. So what is this telling us? Well, being yoked to Jesus isn't about religious obligations, but a relationship with the one who calls us to come to me. It's all about a person. It's about the one who is pulling alongside us, taking our burden and sharing our load. And the good news is that he has greater pulling power than us. Yet, when he says, my yoke is easy, it doesn't mean that there'll be no crosses to bear in the Christian life or that everything will always be easy and plain sailing, as there are many difficulties facing those who follow Jesus, because we live in a world that opposes his rule. But amidst the trials of our faith, we are yoked to Jesus, who is our guide, our comforter, our strong tower, our hope in the storms of life. And that's why Jesus says it's easy. Come to me all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Well, I meet many people who would use those words, weary and burdened, to describe their lives, um, and that they are desiring rest for their souls. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. In other words, Jesus is not a harsh master. He is not some slave driver, or like those rabbis, who made life a misery by their exacting standards and regulations. For, Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
Well, this morning I've just focused on one of Jesus' sayings and there is so much more I could say if we had the time. Uh, but just for a few moments, let me observe the way in which Jesus demonstrated his gentleness in his interactions <clears throat> with other people, such as the woman who was caught in the act of adultery in John chapter 8. Jesus was asked by the religious leaders what they should do with her. They stated that the law instructed such women to be stoned to death. But what did Jesus think? Well, it was obviously a trap. If Jesus had answered stone her, then it would have been against the person that he was, against his true character. But if he said, let her go free, he would have uh, been accused as someone who taught against the law of Moses. Jesus bent down and wrote in the dirt, although what he wrote is not known to us. He then looked up and answered them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. What an amazing answer. We are told that they left one by one, the older ones first, until only Jesus and the woman were left. He then said to her, Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. Then we have the story of Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19. He was a man hated by his own countrymen, not only because he collected taxes on behalf of the Roman authorities from his own people, but because he probably lined his own pockets with some extra taxes too. Jesus called him by name and said that he was coming to his home for tea. Jesus' gentle approach towards someone so despised helped bring him to a place of redemption. Luke also tells us about the thief who was crucified next to Jesus. Despite all that Jesus had experienced, the torture of scourging, the nails, the crown of thorns, the ridicule, the insults, he still responded with gentleness to the man right next to him, who requested to be remembered when Jesus entered into his kingdom. And Jesus replied, today you will be with me in paradise. What about Peter? Brash boasting Peter, who said he was prepared to die for Jesus and then denied Jesus three times. Peter was later restored through the gentleness of that conversation with Jesus on the beach in John chapter 21. Three times he denied Jesus and in that conversation, Jesus gave him the opportunity to confess his love for Jesus three times. A beautiful moment of the gentleness of Jesus. Of Jesus it was said, a bruised reed he will not break and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. What a lovely, lovely saying that is, portraying the gentleness of Jesus. Personally, I think that gentleness has fallen on hard times. It appears that gentleness isn't thought of as desirable quality anymore. There's a lot of focus upon being strong and assertive these days. <clears throat> but Paul tells us, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul goes a step further and instructs Timothy to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. To the Ephesian Christians, he encourages them to live a life worthy of the calling they had received, to be completely humble and gentle be patient, bearing one another in love. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 5, Paul reminds us to let your gentleness be evident to all. Peter, who himself had been a recipient of Christ's gentleness, writes, And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it, but do this in a gentle and respectful way, recognising that a gentle answer diffuses anger. So let me come to land with a wonderful example of gentleness as witnessed by the associate pastor of a large Presbyterian church in California who loved going into the Nordstrom department store in Bel Air during the Christmas season. She couldn't afford to buy much in the store but she enjoyed going around uh, at Christmas time just to take in the ambience. The Christmas decorations were always magnificent and there was live music on many of the floors. On one of her visits, she was on the top floor 
uh, of the store looking at some of the finest dresses in the world when the elevator doors opened and out stepped a bag lady. Her clothes were dirty and her stockings were rolled around her ankles. She just stood there holding a gym bag in her right hand. It was obvious that this woman was well out of place and she was not able to buy anything. The dresses in that department were a thousand dollars and more. And this bag lady didn't seem to be the kind of person that would have that kind of money. Well, the pastor expected the security guard to promptly arrive and usher the bag lady out of the store. But instead of the security guards, a stately saleswoman came over and asked, May I help, madam? The bag lady said, Yeah, I want to buy a dress. What kind of dress? The saleswoman asked in a rather polite and dignified manner. A party dress, the bag lady answered. Well, you've come to the right place, the saleswoman said. Follow me. I think I have some of the finest party dresses in the world. The saleswoman spent more than 10 minutes matching dresses with the woman's skin colour and eye colour, trying to ascertain which dress would go best with her complexion. After selecting three dresses she deemed the most appropriate, the saleswoman invited the lady to follow her into the changing room. The lady pasta was intrigued and attempted to get as close to the conversation as possible. The bag lady tried the dresses on with the saleswoman's help. But then after about 10 minutes, the bag lady said rather sternly, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to buy a dress today. That's okay, the saleswoman said gently. But here's my card. And should you ever come back to the Nordstrom department store, I do hope that you will ha ask for me. I would consider it a privilege to wait on you again. <laughs> what an awesome example of gentleness, if there ever was one. And I believe that is how Jesus would have responded if he were a saleswoman in the Nordstrom department store. So why is gentleness such a big deal? Gentleness diffuses anger. Gentleness brings life and hope. Gentleness earns credibility as a child of God. Gentleness builds bridges for Christ. Gentleness is needed because life can be harsh and unyielding on times. And maybe our question today should be, who could benefit from a little more gentleness from me this week? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we give you thanks that you are a gentle and loving Saviour who invites all who are weary and burdened to come to you to find rest for their souls. Your yoke is easy and your burden is light. We give you thanks that you have not bound us to a tiresome set of rules, but you have invited us into a relationship with you. We thank you that you are our shepherd and you lead us in ways of life and abundance, and you guide us into paths of righteousness and beside still waters. You are so gentle with us. And as followers of Jesus, I pray that this week we might be channels of your gentleness, touching others' lives with the gentleness we ourselves have received. And we pray this for your honour and glory. Amen. Thank you, Steve, for that word to us today. Gentleness is, again, perhaps not a quality that we readily associate with God. And yet, in sending Jesus, God has given us a wonderful example of his gentleness towards his creation. When the people wanted to stone the woman caught in adultery, Jesus responded with patience and calm. And the crowd decided they wanted nothing to do with Zacchaeus. Jesus invited himself to his house. When the disciples tried to keep the children away at arm's length, Jesus called them close and prayed for them. When blind Bartimaeus was told to stop shouting, Jesus stopped and, and took the time to listen to him. 
And when the disciples messed up time and time again, Jesus continued to show them his gentleness and his patience. And sometimes it can feel as though our world is just full of arguments and fights among friends and family online and offline. Our social media platforms are often used to stoke the fires of hate. It can take real strength to hear a person out despite what others are saying about them. It can take real strength to stand aside and reserve judgment. It can take real strength to give people that third, fourth, fifth, sixth chance to love people despite their many failings. But this is what the gentleness of Jesus looked like. It was strength under grace. Let me read to you some words from Jesus' half-brother, James. Do you want to be counted as wise, to build a reputation for wisdom? Here's what you do. Live well, live wisely, live humbly. It's the way you live, not the way that you talk that counts. Mean, spirited ambition isn't wisdom. Boasting that you are wise isn't wisdom. Twisting the truth to make yourself sound wise isn't wisdom. It's the furthest thing from wisdom. It's it's animal cunning and devilish plotting. Whether you're trying to look better than others or to get the better of others, things fall apart and everyone ends up at the other's throats. Real wisdom, God's wisdom, brings a holy life that is characterized by getting along with others. It is gentle and reasonable, overflowing with mercy and blessings, not hot one day and cold the next, not two-faced. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoy its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, of treating each other with dignity and honor. I believe that there is a real need today for gentleness and kindness, not to be those who who fly off the handle and react negatively in every situation, but those who seek peace. Those who are gentle and humble in heart. Those who aren't quick to criticize but are willing to listen when others speak. Those who are peacemakers and not fire starters. When people come to us, do they find gentleness? Do they find rest? Or is it more chaos and anger? The Apostle Paul reminds us that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is in fact gentleness. And so if we think that we are lacking this morning, then we need only pray for more. So let's do that now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your incredible example of gentleness in Jesus. As someone whose yoke was easy and whose burden was light. May that be said of us too. Let our words and our actions be defined by the gentleness of Christ so that the world would come to recognize Jesus in us. Help us to be gracious and kind and refrain from words of anger and hate. And let us be your peacemakers in troubled times. In Jesus' precious name we ask. Amen. Amen. Let's just take a moment to worship together before we finish our service today.
Thank you for being with us this morning. I really hope that you've been encouraged by the service today. Um, and if you need anything, if you need uh, contact from the pastors, you need someone to pray with you, someone to talk to, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us here at the church. You can sign up for our mailing list following the links in the description box below um, if you're not on our church suite platform already. Um, just want to give you an advance notice for an online alpha course that we're going to be starting on April the 21st, that's a Wednesday at 7pm, and we're going to be putting out some more detail about that in the weeks to come. But if you are somebody who has an interest in the Christian faith and would like to find out a bit more, um, then this could be the perfect course for you. You can register an interest by following the link in the description box below. 
But for now, let me just say, take care. I hope that you have a good day, a good week. Stay safe, and we will see you really soon. God bless.